This tutorial is part of our YouTube playlist, TriFlask API Development. So you can watch this course from the start if you prefer. Now, alternatively, if you enjoy this course, you can also purchase this course on Udemy, where you'll find deeper content, source code, and course updates. Links to both the playlist and Udemy course can be found in the video description. Okay, seems like a good place to start creating a new Flask project. So let's go ahead, dive in and create a new Flask project. Before we start the project, just to remind you that you are gonna need Python installed. Now you don't need to install the version that I'm using. I think it's uh, 3.12 as of recording. You can utilize anything from 3.x upwards. You should be pretty much good to go with that. Now it's up to you whether you want to install Docker straight away, Docker desktop, or else just install it as and when we get to that part. And of course, you're going to need a code editor. Now throughout this whole project, we're going to be utilizing Visual Studio Code. So it's completely up to you whether you use Visual Studio Code or maybe you have your own preference. Having said that, if you are new to development in general, it's probably worth following along step-by-step step using the same code editor. First step, we're going to need a project folder. It's entirely up to you where you place your project folder. Here you can see that I'm using a Mac and I'm gonna just place it on my desktop and I'm gonna call this project flask-api. At least I'm gonna call my project flask-api. Now, if you are running Windows, don't worry. I am using Mac throughout this whole project. I will provide additional instructions as and when there are maybe differences between a Mac and Windows, which there won't be many differences. So go ahead and open up Visual Studio Code if you are using Visual Studio Code. I'm going to select open either from the menu here or else if you do have the welcome tab, I can just press open from the, the middle there where it says start. Go over to my desktop. Oh, I've selected the wrong folder already. That's never a good start. So I can just file and close that folder. Never a good start. So open up the desktop. That's the most challenging part of this project. Open up the project folder, uh, press open. There we go. So we have our new project folder. It's called Flask API. With the project open, let's go ahead and select terminal from the menu. Might be slightly different on Windows, but we're looking for a terminal and new terminal. Now notice that there is a shortcut for terminal. So on the Mac, I'm going to press control and the key above the control button on the left hand side of your keyboard. And you can see I'm going to open and close the terminal from there and select terminal, you can see that terminal is selected. Now, although I described it as the terminal, you might alternatively know it as the command line interface. So this is gonna allow us to interact with the operating system and run commands. So it allows us users to execute commands. We can navigate the file system, run scripts, and perform various system tasks should we need to using text-based commands. So we're gonna utilize this to interact with Flask to perform certain actions, for example, start the Flask application. So first of all, let's just make sure that Python is installed, so Python 3 version. So if you're on Windows, you're gonna type in Python space. On a Mac here, I've typed in Python 3 space and then version. So I'm using 3.12. Now don't worry if you're using a slightly different version, everything should be absolutely fine. As long as you're running Python 3 something, then you should be good. In order to use Flask, we will typically need to install it first because Flask is a Python web framework that provides the necessary tools and libraries to build web applications. Now, before we install Flask and start to utilize it to build our API, we're going to need to work within a virtual environment. So what exactly is a virtual environment? Let's see if I can paint a picture here. So. A virtual environment allows us to isolate Python environments for different projects. Take this example here. We have the, the outer box here is, this is our computer. So inside of our computer, we have hardware. We install an operating system. Once we've done that, we can then install some software. So here we have Python 3.12 installed. So let's imagine we're building a Django project. We go ahead and we download Django 5.0 and then we need cores because we're building an API. So we're also installed cores. So there's some uh, packages installed. So this is for our project, project one. Now the problem we've got here is that everything that we've done so far is local to our machine, which means that if we were to, for example, then create a new project, imagine we started a new project, 
all of these dependencies, all these packages, in this case, Django and Cores and Python 3.12, that will also be available for the second project. Now, the problem we've got here is that project two requires a different version of maybe Django or a different package um, or a different version of Python. So the problem we have here, when we work locally on our machine, it's very hard for us to manage all of the packages for multiple projects. So by building a virtual, I said virtual machine earlier, didn't I? Sorry, I apologize. So by building a virtual environment, it means that we can separate our projects. It means that we can install different packages, versions of packages, and build an environment specifically for that project. So that is exactly what we're going to do now by creating a virtual environment. Now we have created Windows and Mac virtual environment setup guides. You will find those Python setup guides for both Windows and Mac in our Python setup module. Right, so let's get started. Here on the Mac then, I'm going to type in Python 3 and then use the M flag. The M flag, this part of the command tells Python to run, in this case, the virtual environment module, the EMV, uh, as a script. So the eventv module is a built-in module in Python 3 used to create virtual environments. It is just one of many ways to create virtual environments. So we now need to specify a folder to host our virtual environments. In this case, it's going to be VMV, but you can call it whatever you like. So once you've done that, you can see on the left-hand side, if you're in Mac, that that then creates a new folder with our virtual environment folders and files. Now, if you're on Windows, you're going to type in Python, MVMV, VMV. So if you're on Windows, you're going to type in that. So now we've created a virtual environment, we're going to need to work within that environment. So here you can see that project one and project two is within a box, so within a virtual environment. So before we start building our application, we're going to need to activate it. So on the Mac here, I'm going to type in source V, I'm going to press tab, then B, I'm going to press tab, and then A and tab. So that will then start the virtual environment in the Mac. And you can see here it says VEMV, indicating I'm now inside of my virtual environment. Now, if you're using Windows, the likelihood is you're going to type in VEMV script activate, or sometimes you might need to type in, uh, for example, dot, dot backslash. Okay, so dot backslash or just VEMV scripts activate, that should activate your virtual environment in a Windows environment. Now, if you are using Windows and you have a big error on your screen, then do check out our setup guides. It will guide you through how to resolve that problem. Okay, so I think we're now ready to install Flask and start building our Flask application. So for that, I'm going to type in PIP, PIP. That's the built-in Python package manager. If I go into my vent folder here, you can see in the uh, bin, you can see that pip has been installed into the virtual environment. So I can use pip, the built-in, like I said, package manager. So pip, and then pip install, we want to install Flask. So go ahead and run that command. All that's happened at this point is that we've downloaded Flask from the Python package index, which is the Python package library. So if I type in Flask, here in the Python package index, so pypy.org. I go over to uh, Flask, which is at the top here, click on Flask, and that's essentially what we've just done. We've pipped install Flask. So that's what we're installing. You can find additional information here, but just to give you some context of what just happened here, we've just simply downloaded Flask from the Python package index. And just about any other installations that we make further along in the project will all be downloaded via pip from the Python package index. So you can go ahead and inspect the different packages if you wish. So if you're on Windows, you can type in CLS. If you're on a Mac, you can press Command and K, that just clears the terminal. Now, before we start, I just want to mention that for new students, it's important to understand that while some learners are very inquisitive and eager to delve into the intricacies or intricate details of all elements, Flask operates as a framework that abstracts away certain complexities. Therefore, especially for those who are new to Python, it's okay to initially accept Flask at a surface level, allowing for gradual understanding and exploration of its functionalities over time. 
So consider our approach in this course as a foundational level of understanding aimed at equipping us with the knowledge necessary to achieve our goal of building a Flask app. Once you've grasped this foundational level, you can then begin to delve deeper into the intricacies and complexities of Flask. Right, so let's start with some basics of building a Flask application by building a small Flask application. So first of all, let's go ahead and in the right hand side here, let's go ahead and create a new file. Let's call this hello. Now we're working with Python, so we're going to need Python extensions. .py. Now, if you're a little bit confused about the name at the top here in the left hand side, I'm using a different folder now. And you might find also that there is a .git attributes file here, but not in your project. It's because I'm using source control. I'm just managing this project slightly different from what you are so that I can organize all my projects and all the work that I do. So don't worry about that for now. Let's just make sure that you have a vent folder and a hello.py file. So let's think of what we're doing here in two separate entities. We have our application and we have the Flask framework. So what we need to do is we need to run our application within the Flask framework. We could think of it that way, right? So what we're going to need to do is to actually bring Flask into our project so that we can run our application within the Flask framework. So let's go ahead and say from Flask, Let's import Flask. Okay. So in this instance, Flask is the Python package library that provides the tools and utilities for building web applications. Flask here is a class within the Flask package, right? So this class represents a Flask application instance. So essentially what we're doing is we're creating an instance of a Flask application, an empty Flask application. And then we spend the rest of the time building our application and running that application within this Flask instance. So it's a three-step process. First of all, we pip install Flask. So Flask is then available within our virtual environment for us to utilize. The second task, we then go ahead and create an application. So let's just call this our application, which we haven't necessarily created yet. And then what we do, we go ahead then and import from Flask, import Flask. So we've created an instance of Flask now within our application. So by importing Flask or the Flask class from the Flask package, we gain access to all of the functionality provided by Flask for building web applications. Now that our project has access to all the Flask features, we can now start thinking about building our project app. Now, in actual fact, just running from Flask import Flask, that doesn't do anything at all because we're not actually utilizing this Flask class. Now, it does help if you do have some object oriented programming knowledge, but what we need to do now is instantiate that class. So we actually need to use this class and that will then give us access to all the Flask features that our application requires. So let's go ahead and say app equals and then Flask so we instantiate Flask to give us access to all the tools and features of Flask. And then we just pass in name. So double underscore name. So we have created a new instance of the Flask class. So we're utilizing now the, the Flask class here to actually create a Flask application. The name argument is a special variable in Python that represents the name of the current Python module. So it is used by Flask to determine the root path of the application. So at this point, we have an empty Flask application. So we can actually run this application from where we stand. So if we, for example, type in Flask, so Flask, this is the command used to invoke the Flask CLI, which provides various commands for working with Flask applications. And then we have app. So this option specifies the Flask application to be run. So we specified hello referring to our hello file here. And then finally run, this is a command to start the development server and actually run the Flask application. So if we run that, we find that we are now running the application and we can find it at this location here, which is 127.0.0.1.5000. Now, if we go over to our browser and actually paste that in, you'll find that there is nothing there. So that's because we have an empty Flask application. 
it doesn't know what to do with that request at the moment. So we need to provide some additional instructions in order for our Flask application to actually be able to deal with that request. So what's happened here is that by navigating to that address from our browser, we're trying to send a message to our Flask application. So 127001 being the local host. So that's an IP address that defines our local machine. It's a local loopback address. So we can send a message to our own computer. And then this port number here, think of this like a door. So that's door 5000. So the operating system can take this request. So we type that into our browser that gets sent to our computer. It can look for this port number and match a, an application that's running on that port that's listening for messages on that port. And of course, our application is listening for messages on that port number. So what happens is that this request that we're making in our URL will actually be routed via our computer to our application. So what we can do, remember that we have this Flask instance. So what we can now do is make modifications to it. So we can use a declarator, which is going to add an additional instruction within our Flask application. So we'll go ahead and use root. So this is going to define a root. So a path which can then be matched against a path that's entered into a browser. So we're able to associate a URL root with the actual application. Now the function that follows, this is what happens when the request is made to this root, to this path. So let's go ahead now and create a new function. So this is just a, a Python function. So let's just call this hello or hello world. And then we'll go ahead and define what happens. So we we'll return, in this case, let's go ahead and return some HTML. So we we'll have a P tag and just a hello. Oh, don't forget the P, there we go. So let's go ahead and I'm just gonna close this server by pressing Control and C. It does tell me how to actually quit that. So I'll go ahead and do that and I'll clear that and we run that again. So we'll run the application again you can see that we've got an error here. So in addition to the command actually running your application, you can see that Flask will actually determine and try and identify errors in your code. And it clearly identifies in this case where the error is. So line five in the Hello Pi module. So let's go ahead and just remove that. And we'll try that again. And this time it will run. We're told that the server is running. So if we go back to our browser now and refresh, we now return hello. So that was the return that we generated or specified within our function. Now it will be important for us to understand routing. Flask routing allows us to map URLs to a specific function as we've seen in our application. So this mapping determines how incoming HTTP requests are handled and which view functions are executed to generate responses. So in an API or in APIs, routing helps determine the endpoints that clients can access to interact with our API. So what we have now then is on the left-hand side here, this is the request we made in our browser. So that request, goes to our PC. So this here is the loopback address. So we're sending a message to our own computer. So what's happened here is <laughs> our computer then receives this request. It looks at the request and determines, it determines what to do with this. So it tries to match, look for any application that might be listening on this port number. Now it just happens that we created a Flask server. So if we imagine this as our Flask server, so that's what we initiated in our, in our command prompt. Within this Flask server is obviously our Flask application. And then within this Flask application, that's obviously then our app. So our apps inside of here, for example. Okay, so this is our Flask application that is running. So what's happening now is that this server that is running it is running, we know, or listening to port 5000. So what happens is that it tells the computer that yeah, we're, we're listening on that port. And so 
when the request comes from the browser, it knows to send that request to our server. Now let's remember that within our application, we've set a route, we've defined a route, and that route is just slash at the moment. Now that represents the root directory. Now because we are sending a request to, in this case, 5000 slash, that's the root. So all that's happening here really is we are essentially just matching this slash here, the root, to the root that we defined in our function. So obviously a match is then made within our Flask application to the request that has been sent from the browser. Then of course the function is then run. The result or return of that function is then sent back to the browser and then rendered in the browser. Now what we could do just to emphasize this point is change this. So if let's, let's go for hello slash. So we've changed the route. So now of course, if we run our server, there won't be a match. So I'm just going to close the server and start again. So if we go back to the browser, now when we refresh on the root directory, you can see nothing is found. However, if we uh, then navigate to hello slash, obviously now this is going to be matched in our Flask application and therefore the corresponding function is going to be initiated. So if I press enter, there we go. So hopefully that gives you a basic understanding of roots. In the browser, we type in a URL and that URL is requesting a resource. So in this case, we're sending to the loopback address, which is our own computer. So here in the middle, the computer will determine where to send that request based upon the port number. Now we are running a Flask server and we know that the Flask server is running on port uh, 5000. So therefore the computer will send that request, that HTTP request from the browser to the server. Now within there, you will pass the message to our Flask application. Our Flask application will try and match the URL to a resource that we've defined in our application. If it makes a match, then it will run the function associated to that resource and return whatever has been returned from that function. Okay, so overall Flask routing is going to be essential for defining the structure, behavior, and accessibility of endpoints in our API development. It's going to enable us to design a well-structured API with clearly defined endpoints. That might not make sense at the moment, but it will be once we start developing our API. So by creating these endpoints, we can handle incoming requests effectively and provide a consistent and reliable experience for our API consumers.